Hey everyone, want to welcome you to the Reality TV Remote Post-Production Workflow Session. I'm your host, Jeff Sangpil. Last year we saw Jay-Z and the team host the incredible super session that showed the possibilities of cloud workflows for episodic television and feature film. Who knew only a few weeks later, every type of post-production business would be scrambling to find ways to have their production and post staff continue working from home. You know, I really should have golfed around last year. Today we're going to focus on the challenges reality TV production companies have overcome and still face in moving to remote and distributed teams and provide a mock workflow that gives a path forward for these companies. We will cover the typical reality television workflow, capture, ingest, edit, finish, review and approval, and delivery. The unique challenges they have going remote and how we can solve them today. Viacom and Max Post were kind enough today to provide sequence groups and clips from the upcoming season four premiere of Jersey Shore. We are using a real reality TV project across this entire remote post-production presentation. Before we get started, we want to give a shout out to our partners that are assisting with the workflow presentation today, Storage DNA, Avid, Adobe, we picked these partners because of their practical approach to solving remote challenges and their familiarity. If you're not already familiar with Key Code Media, we are the preferred US reseller and systems integrator for the post-production industry. Our engineers are extremely experienced helping customers navigate shared storage, edit suites, color suites, audio suites, and asset management environments. We've also spent the last year successfully helping major networks and studios figure out the best approach to remote live and post-production. I can tell you from experience, no two companies have taken the exact same approach to remote post. Each company has their bespoke challenges, and we're here to share our knowledge with design, install, and supporting some of the best in the business. While I can't say names, here's some of the projects that we did in 2020. Remote live kits and control rooms, for television talk shows, as well as reality TV, cameras, microphones, and encoder packages for remote talent. Setting some of these up at the talent's home and installing new equipment in a studio turned control room to receive talent signal while keeping tech staff socially distanced. Others were simple delivery of a kit and working via remote control to get talent set up at their home touch free. Remote editing via VPN. Some of those same shows hosted 15 virtual edit workstations on a private network behind me, editors securely logging in and editing the show in real time. We also rented a fiber connected trailer so finishing editors could safely make the final high res edit with their own bathrooms, completely self-contained. Remote editing via cloud hybrid. For a major streaming network, we hosted remote storage and workstations Distributed editors were also shipped hard drives with proxy content that was continually synced back to our facility. All editors collaborating in real time with no need for a VPN and are able to keep working even if their home internet cuts out for a few hours. Cloud migration. For another media house, we did a complete media migration pulling 90 terabytes from a NAS system, putting it up into a Google Cloud instance. Cloud injection, as it were. Okay, now that we've had our infomercial, let's dive into the tech for today. First, defining the basics before we move into the demonstration. What makes post-production for reality TV unique? 700 to one. The shoot ratio for reality television is considerably higher than other television and film formats. Things are always rolling. There's a grip of footage to process and make available. Multicam. Oftentimes you're looking at multiple camera angles, hopefully using that time code stuff. Sometimes not, as many of us are aware. File types. Media formats are all over the place. iPhones, GoPro, handheld cameras, and even large sensor cameras are used to cover all the action. Before the edit begins, all these formats need to be standardized into a proxy format. Basically, a daily's workflow writ large. Bin or project locking and media management being crucial. Large teams of editors, assistant editors, story producers are all going to need access to projects and sequences in a shared workspace, going well beyond what you can accomplish simply pushing files around with Dropbox. Now that we've defined the unique challenges, 
Let's dive into the workflow demonstration we've prepared today. We're going to start with capture and ingest out in the field. That media is going to push to the cloud and then back to the media facility. And the project and media are also going to be syncing to all the editors, assistant editors, who are working on the project at home. Editors can edit that media locally with bin locking, and that media is synced back to the facility and at every other editor's local drive working on the project. This goes well past what you can do with VPN. Throughout the demonstration today, we're so thankful to be using a real project from a real reality TV show. Max Post is the preferred post house for Viacom, Discovery, A&E, History Channel, CNBC, and Netflix content. They provided us today with a real project and timelines from the upcoming season of Jersey Shore Season 4. That's the situation. We will be doing this demonstration using a real multicam scene from this upcoming reality show. Big thanks to H. Scott Randall for setting this up. All right, let's kick it off out in the field. Hi, we're out in the field on our set collecting camera cards from the shoot today. It's good to get outside. Traditionally, you would have a data wrangler. As we all know, camera cards need to be turned around quickly so they're ready for the next shift in shooting. Copying data, creating that checksum on all the media to make sure you got it, and then getting the media into the cloud, making it quickly available to everyone on our production team. Then. These cards get cleared and sent back out to production. In this example, we have an internet-connected laptop receiving hard drives of media from each camera person. That footage is organized based upon an agreed-upon file structure and dropped onto a storage DNA-connected watch folder. In some locations, an Azure data box or a snow cone might be used instead to FedEx to the cloud. Reality TV can end up in some harsh locales. Now, as this media is being dropped into the folder, we've set up a few tasks to automatically happen in the background. First, the checksum. We need those MD5s. Second, we need to copy to AFS, the Azure file system, where we're going to do four things. One, create original camera media for conform and later archive. Some shows need everything in archive. Two, create ProRes for Adobe Promotional Editorial. Third, create DNX for Avid Show Edit. And four, Frame.io upload for producers and selects. So, for example, if we're syncing a typical reality shoot day, 10 cameras, 29 FIPS, 12 hours, 1080p, that's roughly 4.95 terabytes. At a typical home or cell-based 10 megabit upload, you're looking at around 1,111 hours for all the high-res media to be uploaded. 46 days is not going to be good for us. We need this footage ready for tomorrow. So when we're talking about being in the field, it's obvious that if we want camera to cloud, we would need to transcode to a proxy resolution and upload that first. So as 5G internet proliferates and picks up more speed, getting things uploaded will become faster and easier. That's our nirvana. But for now, why don't we just take it back to the facility? We're operating here as near set. So a typical location has much higher internet, like we have here. Let's figure a one gig connection up, though lots of peeps now have a lot more bandwidth that they can use. On the receiving side of that 4.95 terabytes, it will likely take 11 hours at 940 megabits. After all this data is in the cloud, how quickly can it be ready? If you're uploading proxy first, then that amount of time is dropping significantly. But if you're uploading camera original, it can be transcoded by systems attached to that cloud storage. That part's going to be scalable. You can add more systems to do more work as the load increases and then shut them off when they're done. You only pay for what you eat. If you're getting the media into Frame.io, just figure that that same amount of hours of OC media, once uploaded, will be about four and three quarters hours to be ready to have all it available for anybody to view all of the proxies. I'm now going to hand it off to our production engineer, Matt Flom, 
who will show us what Frame.io and Storage DNA are doing with this media now that it's synced up to the cloud and in our facility. Thank you, Jeff. And as mentioned, I'm Matt Flom with Storage DNA. Very happy to be here with you this morning. Before we begin talking about our integration with Frame.io, let's take a quick moment to recap and show you how we got to this point. We first started with an upload from our field system to our blob container in Microsoft Azure. New footage was then copied from the active blob to an Azure Files file system, which is in the same region as our Windows workstation. Some of you might be asking why data was uploaded to Blob and then to Azure Files. We do this for a few reasons. First is security. Microsoft spends over a billion dollars a year on protecting data, and Azure Blob provides a secure encrypted HTTPS-based connection with configurable keys. Second, Azure Blob provides an instantaneous backup. Blob with zone redundant storage can be protected with 99.129's reliability. Thirdly, Azure Blob costs a fraction of Azure files or any other cloud-based file system. This allows us to delete the data from the file system storage as soon as our processing is complete. From our Azure workstation, we begin by using Avid Media Composer to create our high-res DNX145 media along with an H.264 proxy from the original camera files. While Media Composer is ingesting for the editorial team, we are also using Adobe Premiere and Media Encoder in the background to create a more friendly mezzanine ProRes file to keep for archival purposes. And we're also creating a proxy version, which is automatically sent to Frame.io. The third software mentioned, Resolve, is used for the creation of DCP files and other special projects. With our recent release of DNA Fabric, we now have a direct integration with a collaboration solution like Frame.io. Our solution gives creators the ability to take advantage of all of Frame.io's features with the production team and know that their data is being uploaded automatically from wherever it is located. For this production, we originally created Mezzanine ProRes and Proxy H.264 Media from our original camera files. Within our Frame.io job, we can take a look at the settings that we applied here. So we did an original upload of our Mezzanine files to the cloud. And from within these options right here, we're going to go ahead and select the proxy media here to be sent to our Frame.io target. And in a second here, I'll show you how these files landed within Frame. After a successful upload into Frame.io, we can now notice that our new files were delivered into our project. There's a couple of things worth mentioning here. First off, we have taken the original folder structure from where the media was located. In this case, the mezzanine was chosen. But if you remember within the the settings of the job in DNA Fabric, we chose to deliver a proxy, which is seen here with all these MP4 files. Now from in, within each one of these, we can go into these assets, and in the upper right-hand corner, you will notice a link. This link will take you to the DNA Fabric pages from where the job was uploaded. And from here, once again, we can select, we can multi-select, or we can go up a directory, choose it, and go ahead and retrieve that data to a, the original source location or to a custom location of our choice. While the creative staff has had the opportunity to view the new footage in Frame.io, our transcoded Avid and Adobe deliverables have been sent to our Nexus at Keycode Media in Burbank. The low-res Avid H.264 have been sent to Michael and the other remote editors. And then we've also sent copies of the Adobe Exports ProRes and H.264 files to the Promo House's cloud bucket. Thanks, Matt. Now I'm back at my facility. My Avid Nexus has all these synced media files. We're going to check in with Michael Krulik, who just received the Jersey Shore footage and now can start working on the creative edit. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, well, I'm at home, and uh, you can see that I do have my synced hard drive that was provided to me by Storage DNA. So I have all of my media. So like hot dogs or like this type of meat or cheese, like she have cheese. In here, my project, 
and all of my files are pretty much ready to go. So let's dive into Avid Media Composer, actually the latest version, or should I say upcoming version of Avid Media Composer, and start working with this edit a little bit. Now, uh, this is going to be the version which is going to be released next week. So all of you at HPA are getting a little preview into some things that you might see as um, a little different as we start going through things. If you're taking a look at your bins, you'll actually see there is a bin status that you can display in the lower right-hand corner. Again, this is going to be available in the 2021.3 release of Avid Media Composer coming out next week. But the nice thing here is you'll see I have my bin. There are 82 uh, items viewed right now. If I hover over this, it'll actually show me that it's actually 80 master clips and two grouped clips. So you do get some nice information here. Also, if you go in and select files, you will get a visual on how many you've selected. So that's something is new, and you can turn that on or off depending on your users. So something I just wanted to highlight quickly there. Uh, if looking at Media Composer and how it works with reality, I mean, Media Composer has been out there for years. It's used in a major part of reality television. Uh, you'll see here that this is proxy media that was generated from storage DNA. So you'll see that the proxy is set up for editorial. I'm trying to make you stay away from Oh, that's Mike. the reason? Uh, but I do want to point out some stuff that has been changed recently in uh, multicam editing with Avid Media Composer. It's not anything that's in the new software. It is something I do want to point out was brought in at the end of 2018, where if you do have a grouped clip, you can actually go in and add other camera angles to an existing group. So if I bring in this group clip right here, and you'll see that it has uh, six camera angles, to be played. If I do want to add another camera angle here, I simply right click on the group clip. There's an option to edit the group, and it actually takes that group and puts it into a timeline. So this is showing me the six camera angles that are currently set up. You can actually view you know, the different camera angles. It's actually brought in as a timeline. So I could go into any other camera angle or any new piece of media that needs to be introduced to that. Let's just grab this one right here. It's a random piece of media, and you'll see as I drag it into my project, drag it, as I drag it into my sequence, it's going to come up as a seventh camera angle or a seventh shot to my timeline. What I could do at this point is right click. I could say update my group, and I don't want to actually have it update into the current group, which you know I could have it do. I'm going to create a new group. We'll put that into my grouped bin right here, and you'll see when I do bring that up, you'll see that there is, you'll see that there is another angle in there. Now you're seeing that it's not seven because originally there was no V1 there that was blank uh, due to I think how the sequence was brought in. But you'll see if I want to add another angle there. Let's go ahead and take another clip. We'll drop that in. We'll bring that up here. So there's eight. Uh, just for grins, we'll bring in another one. So here we have nine camera angles, actually might be eight because V1 is gone. So now again, if I right click and select to update the group, we'll create a new group and that one is the extra angles there. So again, being able to go in and add camera angles is really great. But what I also wanna point out is you can go in and create day stacks. So if you go in and have your day stack, which is your different video tracks in a timeline. This is how some uh, reality shows or some sequences are actually built. What you can do is take that day stack instead of starting with a group clip, is you can take a day stack that you've created. I could right click on the day stack and say, create a new group from that day stack. And what that'll do is it's going to take all of the different angles put into the timeline here and you'll see even though there's different cutaways and different parts where the timeline actually stops with the clip, you'll see that there are three angles there, the three different tracks, and it's created a multicam group from my video tracks in the timeline, which is great. All right, some other things to look at in Media Composer and some things that have developed over time with different versions is being able to go into a being able to go into a bin and change you know, names. And this is done through what we call bulk edit. Bulk edit lets you choose your edits in your bin. It could be 
master clips, sub clips, sequences. You could say change the selection. I have nothing selected. Let's say all bin items. It's going to list everything. Let's say just sub clips, or there are no sub clips in there. Master clips, all the master clips. Or again, I could go in and choose my different shots here. Right click, go to bulk edit, or bulk edit could be mapped to a key. And I can go in and change any parameters. And I can go in and change any sort of editing that I want to have done to the name or any column data that can be edited in Media Composer's bins. So if I go in and say I want to add any specific text, say I want to add this to be, you know, audio underscore, I want to add, you know, this is Jersey Shore, so we'll say this is Shore. So this is what it's going to be modified with when I go in to change those names. And that can be any modified, it could be a counter that could be added, that could be any column data. So let's say you have a customized column, a location, maybe a character, maybe a cast member, uh, maybe, you know, date, time, duration, anything that you want can be added in as a modified value. And when I go ahead and say commit, you'll see that it changes there. But I don't want to commit it because I don't want to change my sequence right here. But believe me, once you commit it, that is changed. But along those lines also, what we introduced after that is being able to go in and do a find and replace. So as you start having a lot of copies, a lot of news, a lot when transcodes are brought in, if you do want to take out any .new inside of any name here, we can simply select those files, go to find and replace, which of course is in the fast menu, it's also in the pull down menu, or right click, and can be mapped to a key. I can come in and say I want to find any dot new in my selection or in everything. You're seeing it's all bin content. So it's finding all of my dot news in that bin, even though I only selected this portion here. Or I could say just the selection. So you can choose what you'd like to have it change. So you'll see I can say I want to type in it. I want to type in something to have it replaced with. Like let's say we'll put in sure. Or if nothing is in there and I say replace, In the selection, you'll see that it's taking out the dot new in the names. Let's go ahead and say we'll take all content, replace it all, and it actually has taken out all of the dot news in the names of every clip in that bin. So great, great feature. Takes out a lot of extra work that uh, somebody, the assistant or uh, editor, has to do to go in and take out any piece of. Uh, any piece of the name in the bins, which is really nice. So that's just a small taste of some new and handy features in Media Composer for Reality Television, and actually for anybody who's using Avid Media Composer. So uh, back to you, Jeff. Awesome, Michael. That project Michael's working on is syncing back to our office and to other users in real time. A little note on the typical configuration we would need to do for a remote editor. Each editor could be sent a hard drive, which contains initial media for the show. Sometimes there's recaps and teases from previous seasons. Other media is evergreen, which is not tied to a particular season. External shots, neighborhood shots, regional points of interest, the cool stuff that comes in and out of scenes. Once that hard drive is connected to an internet-connected edit workstation at home, the media on that drive will start syncing new dailies from the facility and the cloud, and projects and renders back to other editors working on the project from anywhere. We all know that the network will want dailies to begin the work of promo. We've put together a folder in Frame.io with selects we'd like to use for the trailer and TV cuts. I simply just need to invite the promo house to our Frame.io session, and now we can all collaborate together on the piece. I put together the folder in Frame.io with selects. I just need to invite Carl from Adobe to the Frame.io session, and now we can collaborate together on this. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I can see the Jersey Shore promo media is arriving, and I've transferred everything securely to my own local drive. 
So let's go ahead and dive into Adobe Premiere Pro and I can briefly show some of the latest features we have to help promo teams collaborate better. We're gonna start with Adobe Premiere Productions and Productions are a new way of both collaborating but it's also about organization uh, and being able to put footage in one central location and have multiple editors pull from it within uh, Premiere Pro. Uh, instead of working with uh, simple projects, we can actually organize those projects and put them in folders and subfolders using this production panel. So what we're looking at here, I've got a production already open and I've currently got a few different projects open. I've got my social media sequences project open and I've also got another scratch project that I've got some media in. And you can see here, all the footage has been organized into these two projects in the footage folder. Now, Van Bedian is actually editing away on some broadcast 16 by nine sequences. So he's got his own project within here. It's locked to me. Uh, I can't go in and modify and cha or change anything. But at the same time, we're both referencing the same approved promo footage so that there's no confusion about which clips we can use. Uh, we both can be in the production at the same time. We can both be editing simultaneously in different projects. So rather than creating a single Premiere project that only one person can access at a time, the production allows us to have multiple projects that are all grouped together. And it also means you can reference material uh, in one location and that those clips can actually live on multiple sequences within the production. It's a really cool way of working. It's new. Definitely check that out if you're not familiar with productions. Now I'm already inside of uh, several of these different productions. One of them is my social media sequences. I'm going to focus on the social media aspect of promo delivery today. And to do that, I need to deliver some different clips in different aspect ratios. Now I'll tell you a little secret. I'm actually going to steal some of Ann's work. Uh, oftentimes we already have the 16 by nine promos cut. Uh, now we need to repurpose them for social media. One tr easy trick to, to uh, use inside of Premiere is the auto reframe functionality. And this is something where I can take a 16 by nine sequence, right click on it and actually choose auto reframe sequence. And by doing this, I can pick a different aspect ratio such as nine by 16, four by five, one to one, and I can easily create a new version of existing 16 by nine content that's already in the correct aspect ratio for social media. This makes it much, much simpler. Uh, it's powered by Adobe Sensei. It uses AI to determine what the, uh, the area in the frame, the, the region of interest is, and will automatically do pan and scan motions to keep that area in the frame. If at any point, if you're looking at a particular sequence and you wanna make some changes to it, if it doesn't do a good job, you can simply just go into the effect controls and there are controls inside the effect controls that let me go in and use an offset to actually, uh, you know, move or change this around. Uh, so it's one of those cases where the AI does most of the heavy lifting, but I can finesse it as much as I need to get it to look the way I want. Now, the next area that we are going to focus on today is dealing with transcription and dealing with captioning. So we're just getting started on this portion. It just came in. Uh, this is a clip of the situation here is talking about uh, some various things. And uh, we wanted to get a uh, an on-screen burn-in caption put together for this. Now, in the newest version of Premiere Pro, there's actually a brand new captioning workflow uh, that's built into a new panel, something called the text panel. And in the captions tab, you can see here, I've got all the individual captions. I can click on a word, I can click on a line, and you can see it's actually moving the playhead for me in the, the uh, timeline. So I can see exactly where my captions are. I can type in here, or if I wanted to, I could actually zoom in on the timeline and you can see now on the timeline, there's this new subtitle track. 
And from here, I can actually click on any of the different controls, any of the different pieces of text here, and I've got a full set of controls over in the Essential Graphics panel. So when you're doing open captioning, you use the exact same controls that you're used to in the Essential Graphics panel. Something that's coming, it's not quite available to the public yet, but if you fire up Premiere Pro, the newest version of Premiere Pro, and you fire up this text panel, you'll see a uh, transcription tab, and that transcription tab is for a feature that's coming later in the year. Speech-to-text transcription uh, using an AI-driven engine can be incredibly accurate, and we are in a special invite-only situation with the speech-to-text transcription function right now. If you are inside of Premiere, if you see the transcript uh, tab in this panel, uh, go ahead and follow the instructions in there to be added to the invite-only beta for this feature. But it'll be coming for everybody later in the year. The last thing I have time to show you here is dealing with uh, motion graphics. And if we want to do motion graphics in uh, Premiere, we've developed a, uh, an entire workflow dealing with motion graphic templates and being able to create templates in After Effects, instead of making one-off graphics that are used one time and discarded, it's possible to build out really amazing templates that can be reused and repurposed. And new in Premiere Pro is the ability to have media replacement inside of your motion graphic templates. So you can build out areas where you can drag and drop new media, and that media is actually in the animation. It will animate on and off with the rest of the motion graphic template. So just as a quick example of this here, and I actually have this in one of my sequences here. Let me go ahead and move over to this sequence. Here we go. So here you can see we're starting a promo. We're bringing up a little bit of social media here. Um, now this motion graphic template, if I'm in the Essential Graphics panel and click on the Edit tab, these are all the different controls that I can work with in here. And this entire area where I currently have some video playing back is just a drag and droppable area where I can uh, change that out. So in this case, I'm just gonna take the uh, Jersey Shore logo and just drag it and drop it over into here. And you'll see that the graphic is going to update. I can go in and just make a quick change here. We'll say we'll scale that to fit so that it fits nicely in the window. And now I'm ready to export this out. So a lot of different options that enable me to make promos faster uh, from using production so that teams can collaborate better, uh, speech to text and new captioning workflows, and then of course motion graphic templates working with uh, media replacement areas where we can quickly repurpose and reuse the same templates over and over again with new media. Back to you. Thanks, Van and Carl. We look forward to seeing that finished trailer. We've got promo off to its own world, and now we have a conform process from Avid's timeline. Let's hand this back to Matt Flom to explain just how the polls are getting done and delivered. Hi again, everyone. So for this part of the presentation, let's discuss how DNA Fabric gives the users the ability to restore data. We have two main methods. The first and our most common one is by our folder based. With this, we can choose one of our catalogs and we can go through our folders to find files, multi-select files, or we can go back up and select a folder and we can choose to retrieve them. We can retrieve them to the source location where they were started from, or we can go ahead and choose a custom location that is mounted on the file system beneath the system right here. Our second method of restoring data is via a ticket-based job. And this is where we'll choose an AAF, an XML, or an ALE file. So from this production, we've got an ALE that I'm gonna go ahead and retrieve against a bunch of data that we've put into the cloud. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the ticket. The directory's already selected. We're gonna choose the Avid with a clip name. We can also choose an Adobe ALE. We can also send Interplay. Uh, I've gone ahead and chose the source name column that we wanna look at. We can retrieve it to the source location that we got it from, or we can go ahead and choose a custom location where we wanna drop it to underneath our file system. So from here, I'll go ahead and select it. We'll hit add ticket. 
In the background here, Storage DNA is looking at that ticket. It's going to go ahead and parse all the information in it, pop it in, in the window. It shows that we got 75 files. Index is good, which means all the files are online. And we could actually open this up and take a look at all the files, look at a status, the date of the run on this, but we can see all the files in our job. So to touch upon just that last section, these are the benefits we see with using ticket-based restores. First off, it's quicker. Using a rich file like one of these, we can pull only the needed files from the backup rather than restore everything. Target options. From one ALE file, we can restore from the cloud, from a file system, and even from a tape. And third is our savings. For cloud productions like these, we can minimize our egress costs by restoring only those needed files. Plus, by using an NLE like Resolve, Adobe, or Avid, these restored files can be accessed by that cloud workstation in the same region, thus saving the need to deliver everything on-prem to do your work. Matt, thanks for getting that all together. Finishing has always been an interesting part of the reality TV process, though. Avid Symphony has been an important tool in getting it all together and delivered. I've personally seen all the Fox seasons of American Idol pumped through it, sometimes in the cramped back room of the live trailer under what's now the Dolby Theater. Color doesn't have the time that the peeps in episodic TV have. It's in the trenches. So make it look as good as possible, getting it ready for review and output. While our editors and assistant editors are all working from home, our final finish process is going to need all high-resolution media and reference monitors back at the facility. Michael Krulik with Avid will be talking about that process of finishing and some of the new tools that will speed up delivery. We're not dumping to SR tapes anymore here. Michael, let's land this plane. Okay, Jeff. Thank you so much. So uh, let's take a look at the Jersey Shore media that we have here. It's uh, been conformed and it's been put onto the Nexus that I have. So this could be a Nexus that I'm remoting into. This could be some uh, media composer and Nexus that I'm at the facility looking at. And an AAF had been brought in and all of the media is now linking to the sequence that was brought in at the high res for finish, which here is DNX HD uh, SQ. So our standard quality Eat whatever you want. format. I have to Google if I can have a cannoli cream. Yeah. A couple of things also that I'd like to show is the inspector tool is a nice panel to add at all times. You could have a workspace that has it. Basically, the inspector tool is giving you metadata on anything that you select in your project. It could be media in a bin. It could be a sequence. It's giving you all that metadata here, which you don't have to go in and keep searching through all of your bins for all of that. It gives you a nice window into all of your information. So if you're trying to take a look at quality and things like that, it's actually really nice. So let's take a look at some features that are also included with Media Composer to help finish. And some of these are included in the next version, which will be out next week. So uh, first thing we want to take a look at for finishing is color. So if we take a look at the color workspace, bring it up right here, just to give you a view into what you're looking at as you navigate through Media Composer, and if you have the Symphony option, which we have here because I am in Media Composer Ultimate, Symphony gives you things like secondary color correction, uh, more control with your hue offsets where you will see your master control, and also you can do source and program side effects. But also if I go into my color correction effect, that brings up things like shape-based color correction. So let's say, um, let's say we just want to take the green of the bottle right here. I could go in and draw a shape around that bottle and then use the secondary color correction tool to go in and pull color. Let's go ahead and pull that green and go in and modify that. And now you'll see that I can go in and modify just the color of the bottle without modifying any color that may have happened outside of the shape. So now being able to do shape-based color correction on a single layer is actually really nice. So other things we want to talk about with color is not just working in HD, but being able to work in ACES and any other uh, high dynamic range or color workflow as well. 
So right now I am in an HD project. Let me go ahead and just change this to UHD. So it is changing the format size. So if I need to deliver something in a higher format, I could do that. But more importantly, I have all of my color spaces right here. So HLG, I have SMPTE 2084. If I go to ACES, of course, we're changing the color of the current image, which is HD, uh, Rec. 709, to try to format, to try and work in an ACES environment, which you'll see it also changes to 32-bit float with the full blue quality down on the bottom of my timeline. And now as far as delivering, we can export from Media Composer in all the different standard formats. We do have, you know, we can export graphic files, we can export ALEs, we can export AS11, DPX files. It does say IMF, but uh, hold on, we do have a whole new thing with IMF exports. Uh, OpenEXR, MOV, and MP4, this is using the new Universal Media Engine, or UME. So what you'll see is I can go in now, choose my video format, and these formats can be ProRes, DNxHR, DNxHD, H.264, H.265, or MJPEG, and also exporting PCM or AAC audio in MOV or MP4 formats. So what I can show you is a new way to create IMF packages with the next release of Avid Media Composer. So under the Tools menu, you have IMF Window, which provides a whole new way to create your IMF packages. You'll see here the folder set up. I have JS. You'll see I have JS1 set up as my IMF name. We have the IMP file. And we have the sequence, which I simply dragged in. You can go in and create new IMF supplementals or original packages by selecting here. Or if you do make a change to your sequence, you can simply drag that into your current IMP and go in and create a new set of supplementals or changes that are set with the new sequence that you've dropped in. And you'll see all of the new changes and things that you can set up here as far as going in to change the compression, the res resolution you want for the file, colorimetry, color depth, setting up your audio files, or audio mapping along the way. So we, we, we could definitely get into a lot more stuff with Avid Media Composer, but that about wraps up my portion for this presentation. I'm going to hand it back to Jeff for now, but reach out if you have any questions, and we'll see you all later with the Q&A. Thanks, Michael. We look forward to seeing that make it to air. So before we deliver our final project, I want to talk a little bit about media management, moving media in the cloud and archive. Now for me as this particular showrunner, as it were, I just send an email, hit that easy button for me. But there's a process to archival, and it's so important. Matt will get into that for us. Hey, Jeff, good to see you again. So during this entire production, we've made sure that DNA Fabric has been able to back up all new and changed files, whether they were written to the Nexus at Burbank, uh, the remote edit systems, including Mr. Krulix at home, and any of the new files that the promo house has uploaded to their cloud storage have all been now backed up to our primary hot disk inside of Microsoft Azure. So let's take a quick moment here and show you how we're doing all this. From our main web page, I'm going to go ahead and select the job. I'm going to select the client upload. This one in particular is the Nexus in Burbank. I'll select my store and my configure options here. And you'll notice that the job is now set to run every 30 minutes. This can be changed to run hour, minutes, whatever we want. We can do days and weeks. On the option side here, I've gone ahead and increased the number of streams. This will mean the number of concurrent files that we're gonna upload in this case. So we're gonna do 10 on here, and we're gonna go ahead and notify me in case there were any failures on any of our job. Moving back to the slide presentation now, with everything in the Azure hot blob here, including the Nexus at key code, uh, Michael Krulik's home and all the other remote editors, the Adobe houses uploaded footage to their cloud, and the Azure file system, we can go ahead and delete this data if it's no longer necessary. This will free us up a lot of money. 
Now, at the same time that we've had these jobs all running automatically from these locations, we've had a separate job that has been taking our Azure blob and archiving it to Azure Archive. All right, we're going to recap before we move to our live Q&A. For that, please submit your questions now, and we'll be answering all of them before our session time runs out. What we demonstrated today was a true step into the future of reality TV post-production from anywhere. Taking a cloud hybrid approach, we've demonstrated you can have large multicam projects with a large amount of editors and production staff collaborating from anywhere. You can also do this without bleeding money, sending files up and down in the cloud. You're also not suffering from the quality drop in video and audio that some can experience with VPN or cloud edit solutions. We also showed this working today in a workflow connecting Avid and Adobe, and this is ready today with the most common tools used by editors. The systems at home with the media, yet still connected to the whole team and collaborating together. All right. Let's jump into the Q&A.